Hello everyone, and welcome to Practically Fearless with Chris Garada. Today I'm excited to welcome a man who has helped North Texas community more than you might know. He's the president of Redbird Development Group and played arguably the biggest part in the redevelopment of Redbird Mall in South Dallas. He's also spent over 12 years helping to educate underserved Texans through the nonprofit KIPP Texas Public Schools. He currently serves as a board member there. Mr. Peter Brodsky, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, you have built an impressive list of accomplishments in your career, but those accomplishments have come at multiple moments in your life where you had some struggles. Your mother was diagnosed with MS when you were only 11 years old. You had to go through the pain of losing your sister at a young age as you were building up your career. And what we like to cover here is the idea that life can be hard and yet we persist, we persevere fearlessly. And I'd love for you to give us a little bit about your early history and what drove you as you were beginning to build your career through that grief. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And second of all, uh, I really appreciate this opportunity because usually I have to pay someone about $250 an hour to sit and listen to me <laughs> talk about my childhood. So I feel like I'm getting a great deal here. Deal. Um, so it, it's true that I had a lot of uh, tragic things happen in my childhood. Um, my sister actually died when I was 15, so lo long before my, my career uh, began. Um, but I've always been a, a relatively happy person, a very, very neurotic, anxious. Um, real, my wife calls me the 6'1 Woody Allen. Um, I'm, I'm very, very neurotic and anxious, um, but I'm anxious about things that I worry will happen. When, thi when things actually happen, I'm very uh, calm and able to function. When the bad thing actually happens, maybe because of, maybe in spite of those uh, neuroses, uh, I, I really am, am able to, to function. Um, I, I think I attribute that to, uh, to biochemistry. Uh, I attribute that to being very fortunate of, to have had people in my life who've always loved me. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've never, I've always had, you know, at least one person, usually multiple people who, for whom I was their number one priority. Um, and, and, and I was number one, so I, I had a very solid base. Um, and because I'm, uh, you know, a New York Jew, I've been in therapy since I was 11. Um, <laughs> you know, for real. Um, that, that was the first time I ever went to a therapist, and I've been going on and off my entire life because I really believe in the power of talking about what's on your mind and using that as a way to either make it less scary by saying it out loud uh, or working through what's causing the fear so that you no longer have the fear. There is a lot in what you just said to unpack, which is very rich. One thing is you talk about biochemistry, you talk about neuroses or anxiety, that sort of stuff. Everyone feels those things at some point, some more than others for sure. But then you pivoted into therapy. I think that it's how we deal with anxiety and those kinds of worries that we have every single day. And it sounds like you, from a very young age, took responsibility for those feelings. You voiced those feelings, and then you said they kind of took away a little bit of its fear. That, that, that right? That, that's true to an extent, but, but let me tell you a story. When I was 20, seven or 28, uh, I was at a, an inflection point in my career where I was being given more and more responsibility at my firm. I worked for an investment firm. And I sponsored my first deal. It was the first deal that had my name all over it. I wasn't yet at a position in the firm where I could do that without a partner kind of co-signing on it. Uh, and so the deal was done and one day on a flight home from a business trip with that partner, he said to me, 
I just want you to know that I think that deal is awful. I think we're going to lose all our money, and it has your name all over it. That felt good. Uh, yeah, I don't like that guy. No. Um, I got off the plane. My wife was picking me up at the airport, and I proceeded to have a panic attack that lasted for about 72 hours. Oh my God. I didn't sleep. It was a weekend, so I couldn't get any medication. I was like taking Benadryl. It was the only way I could get any sleep. A and that was a moment where I went back into therapy. And I wanted to understand why it was that that comment caused me to tailspin. Triggered you. Right, so, really, really badly. And during the course of therapy, I decided to go on antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't believe in doing that without talk therapy, but I do believe in doing that in conjunction with talk therapy, at least for me. Um, it takes about a month to kick in. And after about a month, I said to my wife, I just realized that that pit I've had in my stomach for the last 28 years is not a normal condition. And, um, and I've been on them ever since. So, and I have tried going off them at times and I always end up in a panic attack at some point. And what I've realized about my biochemistry is that it is such that when I have an event that would cause someone else anxiety, it causes me extreme panic and that's not normal. And it actually is counterproductive because it, it, it actually prevents you from dealing with the problem because you're, you're panic stricken. And so it's not that I don't feel anxiety anymore, I do, but, but it's leveled to where I can manage it. In response. In response, and, and that it's leveled to where talk therapy or problem solving or going for a run or talking to my wife or whatever works. Yikes. Now in your life, that kind of mental health is something that you've, I mean, had for at least the second half of your life. And so how often do you talk with people about that? Because I find in my experience that mental health is something most people ignore. That it takes an event like a 72 hour panic attack <laughs> to finally send someone seeking some help. If people are a little short of a 72-hour panic attack, how would you encourage them to consider seeking help so that it's destigmatized and instead people Well, I think there's two differences between mental health and physical health. Mental health and physical the health. first is what I suffered from, which is that I didn't know that what I was feeling was abnormal. I didn't realize that everybody wasn't walking around with a pit in their stomach versus if you have a massive gash on your forehead, sure. it's pretty obvious that no one else is walking around like that as a normal condition. Uh, or, you know, or, or if you're diabetic, uh, it's pretty obvious that no one else is walking, most people aren't walking around going into insulin shock. Um, and so there is the difficulty of diagnosing the issue unless it's extreme. And then the other, the other difference is that there is a stigma. And it, it is in certain parts, certain communities, uh, in certain sort of subcultures of the American culture, it is considered a weakness. Yeah. The stigma and the, and the lack of, of cultural acceptance is a real problem. And I think, but I think it's those, the combination of those two things prevent people from seeking the mental health. I guess the third one is insurance very often doesn't cover it. Um, but it's, it's as real as anything else. And anytime anybody says to me, I think I can manage my problem without, you know, without medication, I say, if you were a diabetic, would you try to manage your problem without medication? Maybe you can, I'm sure you can live the way you're living, but why? Why, why are you doing it? There, what, what is the benefit to you of doing that? Well, I don't want to not feel my emotions. I feel my emotions. 
I, I get happy, I get sad. I get nervous, I get excited. I even have panic, but it's, it's under the bell curve. Manageable. It's manageable. So that kind of experience, you named that in some communities, in some circles, that can be seen as weakness, mm -hmm. like needing help in a sense can be seen as weakness. You passed through that experience. You understood you needed help. You got the help you needed. I imagine that given your success in business in many other ways, you were able to take that experience and develop a lot more empathy for people who may be under-resourced, not have the kind of access to healthcare that you named earlier, or might even just simply see that as embarrassing or a weakness. How have you used that strength? I mean, you turn that weakness into a strength. How have you used that strength now in the second half of your life to make some pretty courageous decisions? Well, you know, on the specific issue of, of mental health, you know, the, what, what I always, I, I'm not embarrassed about it, obviously. Um, that, that really is a result. I mean, I joked about being a Jew from New York, but I'm sort of not kidding. In that culture, yep. everyone's in therapy. Sure. I mean, I grew up, my mother had group on Tuesday night, my father had group on Thursday night, like it, it was, and, and all my friends did too. It was, it, it was, it was not a, not, there's no stigma to it. So I'm not embarrassed about it. So I, sometimes I think just talking about it can help people. Um, I think the, the broader question about, uh, you know, h how to react to people that don't have the same opportunities that I've had, you know, I, I don't know exactly what it is that has always, not always, I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten more aware, but at a certain point, I became very, very aware that the life I've lived and that I'm living is is not only not typical, but extraordinarily lucky. And um, I, I was never told in my childhood, and I didn't grow up like super rich, but I grew up, you know, definitely upper middle class. My father's a New York attorney, you know, I got a great education, all that. I never wanted for anything. Frankly, I find it very irritating when people who were you know, there's an expression born on third base, but you think you hit a triple. Yep. Um, there's a lot of people who go through life born on third base and think they hit a tri triple. Um, and I find it very irritating because it's just so obvious that if any of us had been born uh, in the Soviet, if I'd been born in the Soviet Union in 1970, I would not be where I am today. And it literally has nothing to do with me where I was born. But that set me on a trajectory. That awareness is really important because as you noted, a lot of people don't have the self-awareness that they perhaps did not earn a lot of their opportunities. You know you have significant capacity and you've made choices along the way, especially in the last 15 years, to try to use your capacity, use your abilities to make sure that access to opportunities are spread to a lot more people. I know that you learned about Southern Dallas and some of the needs there about 15 years ago when you went through Leadership Dallas. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what pivot happened in your mind and why you began to consider, I would say, putting a huge amount of effort and energy and resource personally at risk to try and meet the needs of some of the most underserved communities right here in our city? Well, I mean, there's a million, there, there's a million different ways to answer that question. As you and I were talking about before we started, uh, you know, on camera, ultimately I believe that everybody does everything for, for, for selfish reasons. I mean, the reason why I do what I do is because I find it very personally fulfilling. Um, why do I find it personally fulfilling? That's a, a probably a deeper question. But essentially what happened was I was at a point in my life, I had been in a career that was very money focused. Um, I was very fortunate to have had that opportunity. I was very for fortunate to have done well there. 
and I, and I realized about myself something, which was that a lot of the people I was working with, and, and this is not a knock on them um, at all, but they had almost an insatiable appetite for more. And I, I don't think it's because they're greedy, they're very philanthropic, all that, but I think that sense of competition, it, be, it, it stops being about the money, it starts being about the competition, and the competition really drove them. Um, and that's great. It stopped driving me. Um, I started to get bored. And when you start to get bored at your job, you stop being very good at your job. And I noticed that I was not as good at my job. And because um, my, my mind was elsewhere and my heart was elsewhere. And so then I spent several years trying to find what it was that would be of interest to me. And that's why I did the Leadership Dallas class, uh, because I was actively looking for something that was going to be satisfying. I wasn't, I have a lot of the competition thing in me too, mm -hmm. so I wasn't at a point where I wanted to be like, at one point, I, I always had a fantasy I'd be a math teacher, and I, and I wasn't at the point where I was ready to go be a math teacher. I still wanted the business challenge, I still enjoyed the, the competitive aspects of that, but I was looking for something that, that had more to it. And one of the things that the Leadership Dallas class opened my eyes to was the racial history of Dallas. And through that, I became a lot more knowledgeable about the racial history of America. I mean, I knew, I knew the basics, um, but I really didn't understand the nuances, and, I, and I'm still learning. But I find that um, I find the, the American uh, experience of African Americans so profoundly unjust and continuously unjust. I, it's, it's deeply, deeply unfair and has impacts way beyond what I think any of us can imagine. And so the opportunity to address some of those inequities in my home, you know, what's now my hometown, was very attractive to me. It was, in, it's, I find it intellectually stimulating, just understanding how the system was designed and what the reverberations of it are. It's very intellectually stimulating. Um, it, it feels good. To, be, to, to see your work have a positive result. I've made really deep friendships with people that I would not otherwise have met, really some of my very, very best friends. Um, and, and I saw a money-making opportunity as well. So it kind of checked every box for me in terms of what I wanted to be spending my time doing. So you spoke about being philanthropic. I want to differentiate philanthropy from kind of taking risks and being fearless because I would say that what you've been doing over these last few years might have a positive impact and so you could consider it kind of philanthropic in that regard. I think it's bigger than that. You named something that I think seems counterintuitive. In my experience, for most people, the more they have, the more invested in keeping what they have. When people don't have a lot, they tend to be a bit more generous, relatively speaking. You seem to be bucking that conventional wisdom in a way that could inspire others who might be fearful to put themselves at risk because they want to make sure they protect everything that they have built or earned or have. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people who actually have a huge capacity and are kind of feeling like there's an opportunity, but they're not entirely sure whether the risk is worth the potential reward? I kind of feel like that may be where you would have been at that point. I mean, I, I don't want you to give me too much credit. I also <laughs> want to protect what I have. I'm not looking to, uh, I'm not looking to, to come out with less uh, 
I'm, I am aware of the fact that if I did come out with less, I would still be incredibly lucky and have a great life and be just fine. Uh, but, but I didn't go into this thinking, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw this money away because it's for a good cause. I profoundly, I've used the word profoundly and deeply too much, but I really 100% believe in this investment opportunity. And, and the investment opportunity is, is based on a core belief, which is that everybody deserves nice things. And, and that communities that are perfectly capable of paying for the nice things still aren't given them because of the assumptions made about them or the, the, the unspoken and maybe even un, uh, unthought but still there belief that they don't deserve those nice things. And I believe that they do deserve them and I know that they can afford them. And, and so I thought this is actually not that high a risk investment. Um, now, if I knew then what I know now, <laughs> It's plenty risky, just because real estate is risky and the economy goes up and down and, and, and convincing other people that they should put their businesses at Redbird is hard. Um, but to me, it was the perfect opportunity to make an investment that I really believed in that, that aligned completely with my values. You've sort of crossed some lines in this project in the sense that you've stretched yourself, you've exposed yourself, you've learned so much about, you mentioned racial history not only in Dallas but in America, and then you've been challenging yourself to do things that might not be the easiest path to walk. Is there one example of something that you have learned or perhaps a story of a particular person that could exemplify the exposure that you have gone through and how that has impacted you in a positive way? Well, a, a couple things come to mind. I think this isn't about a person, but an experience that, that, that I've had that I've really had to learn how to navigate is the risk of, um, of people thinking that I think I'm the white savior. One thing I've been very um, made very aware of is that the community that, that I'm working in at Redbird, and I could generalize to say most African American communities, they don't want to be saved. They, they don't, don't need to be saved. They don't need to be. Um, and I understand that there are civic aspects to it, and there are some things we've done that are civ more civically oriented. Um, but it, but bottom line is. This is, a, this is a market that is being underserved. And so, so and I've, I've gone off on a tangent, but I, it's very dangerous if the community thinks that you think you're the white savior. Sure. Um, and I don't, and I've made very sure that people understand that I don't think that. Um, in terms of, uh, of an individual, there's something that happened to me just recently that actually made me feel really good. We were at the Tom Thumb press conference at City Hall. There was a guy from the community who happened to be at City Hall for another reason. And he sat in on the press conference after the city council meeting. And he had been um, not very uh, kind to me on Facebook uh, over the years. Um, and he came up to me and he said, I just want you to know that I still don't like you, but I really respect and appreciate the work that you've put in to make this grocery store happen. He emphasized again that he didn't like me, which is fine, but it did feel good um, to have kind of convinced someone that even though I may not be their cup of tea, that my, that my intentions are good. Well, I think that that's a good 
way to kind of wrap this up because you've shown a lot of dignity, respect, honor for the community in Southern Dallas. Um, and I love that you said, you're not saving anybody. This is a good opportunity and it's gonna be a win-win for everybody. Um, I appreciate you being with us today. Um, Peter, thanks for being here and thank you all for listening. And remember, you have the power to be fearless. <laughs>